past weekend, I uh, made some plumbing repairs around my house. And uh, I made three trips to Home Depot, because if you're fixing something, you never just make one trip to Home Depot. At least I don't. And uh, I was surprised, and I found this in a number of occasions, just surprised by how little things um, are so refreshing to me. Uh, like, for example, walking into Home Depot without putting a mask on. It's like, it just feels good. Or um, walking down the sidewalk and, and having another person come the other way and not crossing the street so as to not cross paths. You know, these just little things that there is a yearning, I think, inside of me and inside of, of a lot of us just for things to be back to normal, right? for, for things to be the way that they used to be. Those semblances of, the, of life as, as we knew it. And we're experiencing some of those things. But I'm also seeing that on a larger scale, the return to normalcy remains elusive. Right? That there are still things that, on, on, a, on a little smaller scale, things are coming back, but there are things on the, on the bigger picture that we're discovering that recovering from a two-year crisis is, is a completely different animal even than surviving a crisis or going through a crisis. Right? When you're going through it, it's like kind of buck up, we've got to buckle down, we've got to do these things, we've got to make it, we've got to figure it out. And after it's done, you just want to go, oh. But, but then you find that there's this whole new world that we're having to find our way through and navigate. And the pandemic gave, gave way to, um, you know, the um, rising inflation and, and all the um, struggles and challenges that are come to families and, and households with that. And then um, what we thought was the Cold War that one of our former presidents declared was over is now resurfaced and, and feels like it's red hot. And, and so even we're moving from one crisis into what feels like another crisis, and, and these things are going all ar on ar around us. And, and I think there's this kind of sense of this question, is, like the, is the universe a runaway train that was created by some subatomic explosion and is now hurtling toward annihilation? Like, are we on this road to ruin? And there's a lot of hopelessness that surrounds that sense of just one thing after another after another before we even have a chance to catch our breath before the next shoe drops. And it leads to hopelessness for a lot of people. And hopeless people live self-focused lives. Hopeless people live self-focused lives. And self-focused lives are ultimately destructive lives. Right? I don't necessarily mean selfish. Some hopeless people are selfish. If you, know, if you think like everything's going, um, you know, to, to an end. It's like, well, I'm going to get my own. I'm going to find my way. I'm going to do what I have to do to, to get through another day that it becomes, can be very selfish. Sometimes hopeless people are self-loathing. I just hate myself or I hate my life or I hate the world that we're living in. Sometimes hopeless people are self-medicating, right? Just to anesthetize the pain of, of feeling hopeless. And, and all of those things all of that hope leads to a place of destruction. By way of contrast, hopeful people are people who believe that things are going to get better again. And, and even though it might be hard right now, there's a, there's a day coming that things are going to, maybe not like they were, but things are going to be better again. That they have a picture of a future that's better than the world that we're living in right now. And if you believe that things are going to get better, that there's hope in the future, then hopeful people act on that hope. And, the, and those actions are for the good of themselves and for the good of others, for the good of the world. The, the question is, is, is there hope? Is there hope? Which brings us back now this morning to the Apostles' Creed, 
We're in a series we started last week called I Believe. What is it that Christians believe? And we're using the Apostles' Creed as a framework to focus on the key tenets of the Christian faith going back to the original teaching of the Apostles. Again, the Apostles didn't write the Creed, but it's considered to be a, 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 um, an accurate summary of what the Apostles taught. And so I told you last week, um, and we're going to start this morning, every week we're going to recite the Apostles' Creed. And, and I invite you this morning to say it with me. Uh, the words are going to be up on the screen. If you're watching online, I think that we have um, those words that will be popping up in front of you. I encourage you to say at home. Um, this is us participating in worship, all right? So you ready? Here we go. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under the Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended to the dead. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I believe. The first words, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. What does it say? Well, first of all, it says God is the Father, right? God is a Father. And it says that that Father, Father God, is Almighty. That, that Almighty Father God is the creator of the heavens and earth. It says that God is personal, that he's relational as a father in this relationship, that God is personal and that God is powerful, almighty. It, makes, it reminds me of David's words in Psalm 62. One thing God has spoken, two things I have heard. You, O God, are strong, and you, O Lord, are loving. Why did the apostles profess their belief in this, core, in this as a core tenet of the Christian faith? Why did they believe and profess and teach that God is Father from what they learned from Jesus, and why did they believe that he is almighty? God is, according to the scriptures, and this is attested to um, over and over again, first of all, that he is the eternal Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. That God is the Father of the Son. Gabriel told Mary when he announced to her that she was going to have this child who was going to be the Messiah, he said to her, this, this child that you're going to have is going to be the Son of the Most High God. The Son of the Most High God. And then as Jesus grew up, you remember the story where he went, his family traveled to Jerusalem for one of the festivals, and, and they were on their way home, and his parents realized that he wasn't with them, and they went back to find him in the city, and they found him at the temple. And he was, they, they were so upset, and it's like, Jesus, why did you do this to us? And he said to them, what? He says, did you not know that I would be in my father's house? That as a child... He understood himself to be God's son. And then the story at his baptism. Jesus is baptized by um, John the Baptist in the River Jordan. And he, and he goes up down into the water and he comes up out of the water. And, and there's a voice from heaven that says, what? This is my son. This is my son with whom I'm well pleased. And then Jesus from there goes out into the wilderness and after 40 days of fasting and isolation in the wilderness, he's tempted by Satan. And, and Satan gets in on the picture too with what? What does he say to him? If you are the son of God, prove it. 
if you are the son. Jesus goes on to face that temptation. Jesus repeatedly, as he talked about, talked to his disciples, and he, as he talked to the crowds and he's told parables, referred to God as Father. When Jesus prayed, he prayed, Father. And when he taught his disciples to pray, he taught them to pray what? Our Father. Jesus, in fact, in John chapter 17, in, uh, in his last prayer with his disciples on the night that he was um, arrested, he, he went so far as to say, I and the Father are one. We're from the same cloth. The apostles taught that Jesus was the eternal Son of God because the testimony of Scripture and the words of Jesus and the teachings of Jesus throughout his life ascribe that position, that relationship to him and him to himself. And then through Christ, God can become our Father. Our fathers haven't always gotten it right, right? Many people have a very difficult time with the concept of God as our father because it's hard to separate that label, that name, that title from the experience that many people have had with their father. But even that, if you look at the impact that a bad relationship with an earthly father has, or even an, a, a completely absent relationship with a child who never knew their father, the impact of the absence of that relationship or the hurt is disproportionate to all other kinds of pain, different than all other kinds of pain. Even though our fathers maybe failed us, for, for some of us, that, that in and of itself is, is showing us how important the role is. And those of us who had a, a loving father, a good father, testify to how important having that foundation, that love, that support is. Jesus came to restore our relationship with God as Father. It was a simple, com central component to his mission. He said... Or it says of him in John chapter 1, to all who received Jesus, to those who believed in his name, he gave them the right to become children of God, children born not of a natural descent nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. In Matthew chapter 7, as part of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, to the crowd that's listening to that day. Which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though, are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? The God wants to have this Father child relationship with us, that Jesus came to restore that relationship. And, and Jesus goes on in, in Luke to say the gift that he wants to give us, that he desires to give us, is that spirit that gives us new birth into a relationship with our Heavenly Father. Jesus is the Son of God and paved the way for us to be his children through a relationship with God through Christ. Jesus prayed, Father, I want those you have given to me to be with me where I am, to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. That God isn't just Father, God is Father, but this Father is the Almighty, the Apostles' Creed said, the Almighty Maker of heaven and earth. 
Jesus in this passage says that God existed even before there was creation. Creation, humanity has been working in earnest to understand the, the, the origins of the universe almost since the beginning. In fact, if you go back to the beginning of the story, it's actually what God said. Hey, here's the world. I'm giving it to you. I'm entrusting it to you. I want you to study it, learn about it. He actually told us to explore the earth and the creation and to figure out how it works and how all the pieces work together and to fill it up with stuff. He told us to do that. But scientific explanation always starts with something. And Jesus says that God existed before all the other somethings came into the picture. That God didn't start with something, that God created the universe out of nothing. That God was the acting force in creation. In the prologue, in the introduction of John's gospel, it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And through him, this Word, all things were made. You go back to, the, again, the beginning of the story, what does it say? God said, let there be, and there was. God spoke words, he spoke the world into existence, the universe into existence. It was spoken, it was created by his word. And, and then you fast forward to the, um, the passage in John chapter 1, verse 14. It says, and the word, the word that God spoke, the, the word that created the universe became flesh and made his dwelling among us. God is the acting force in the creation. We can debate when it happened, 6,000 years ago, 6 million years ago, 60 million years ago. You can have that conversation. It's not what the apostles are addressing in this specific context. You can talk about how it happened. But what Jesus taught and what the disciples are giving us this much here is about who. Was it an accident? Was it the product of, of warring gods as they believed back in ancient times? Or was it done on purpose? Was there intention? It's about the who. Who the almighty God, and the why. Because of his love. And the love that he made the creation for us to enjoy. That God existed before creation. That God was the acting force in creation. And that this almighty God continues to sustain his creation. Jesus says he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good. Sends the rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Now, right, the sun rises every day, the sun sets every day. Scientists can look at it and explain, okay, the circle's going around and spinning around the sun and, and, and all of that stuff, right? But what if God stops? doing his part in this. Does it continue to work without him? Jesus says, look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or st store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not, not, not much more valuable than they? He's taking care of the birds. He says, he's taking care of you. Do not worry, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these other things will be given to you as well. Paul says, in him, in him, we live and move and have our being. 
Without him, we cease to exist. That God continues to sustain his creation. And, and Jesus taught his disciples too. And in the same vein as the prophets had said thousands, of, hundreds of years before and thousands of years before, that this story of a creation that has fallen is going to be restored. That there will be a day when all things will be made new again. A new heaven and a new earth. That while it is full of heartache and pain and sickness and disease now, that it's not the end of the story. It's not the end of our story. It's not the end of the story of creation. That it is not a train hurtling towards annihilation. But it's a story of God's love, of a heavenly father, for his creation and the crown of his creation, humanity, as a loving father. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. Why does it matter? Does that matter, right? If, if that's true, if, if I believe that, what difference does that make? God's almighty power over creation and his fatherly love for his children provides the conditions for hope. Right? That God is in charge of it, that God is running it, that God created it, that God sustains it, that God has power, provides the conditions for the hope, for a life of hope, and the promise of help to make our way through the world that it isn't an accident, that it isn't ending in tragedy, that God is the creator, that God is the provider, that God is the sustainer, and that God is the restorer. I introduced you last week to the Heidelberg Catechism, uh, this lovely document that I grew up studying immensely. It still has such great information in it, right? I never studied this like I did this week. And there's really, really good stuff in there. It's just sometimes hard to parse out. But I, this is what it says. Because God is our almighty Father, a maker of heaven and earth, creator, provider, sustainer, restorer, he is able to do this, to sustain it and to restore it because he is almighty God. God desires to do it because he is a faithful father. He can and he does. Because God is father and God is almighty. The Heidelberg Academy goes on to say, we can be patient when things go against us. He will provide whatever I need for whatever I'm going through, body and soul. It's a hard time because God's almighty, because God is Father. We can endure suffering. We can persevere. We can be thankful when things go well. I'm the kind of person that when things are going well, it's like when's it? and the next shoe you're going to drop. One thing, you know, instead of saying, thank you, God, for a good day. God, thank you, God, for my trip to Home Depot without a mask. Thank you, God, for walking down the sidewalk on a beautiful sunny day and passing a neighbor and not running away on the other side or being hid behind. Thank you, God, for the good gifts that you have given us. We can be confident in the future because we know nothing will separate us from his love. He will turn to my good whatever adversity I experience in this sad world. My um, Deb's brother, uh, David, was diagnosed with cancer um, many years ago. Uh, seven or eight, I guess. I don't remember. I should. Um, 
and, and his cancer was, was not treatable. It, well, it was not curable. When he got the diagnosis, they said, basically, we have these drugs. They'll probably get you through one year. We have these drugs. They might get you through another year. But when the drugs run out, it's going to be the end of your story. Dave was a person of faith. He believed and he prayed for a miracle. And he was also a pretty practical guy, so he plan hoped for the best, but he planned for the worst. But, but God gave him this passage from Romans chapter 8. It says, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate me from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Not even death. If that's where this story ends, not even death will separate me from my almighty Father's love for me in the future that he's written. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. When I read the Bible and as I pray, and as I walk, live by faith, I always remember um, the person who came to Jesus who um, had a son who needed healing and restoration. She said, if you have faith, you will be healed. She says, the, the man said, I believe Help my unbelief. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. Help those places in my life where I believe it, but I'm not living like I believe it. I'm not living like I have a father. I'm living like I'm an orphan. God, help, I believe, help my unbelief. So I'm going to give you um, three exercises. Try this at home, right? Things that I think have helped me and can help you in your unbelief. First of all, do this. Engage the work of the creator. The average person spends 93% of their time indoors. 93% of our lives is lived in artificial lighting, in temperature control, on artificial surfaces. Now, I'm thankful for all of those things. They're good. But the psalmist says, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim his handiwork. The fields are jubilant. The trees of the forest sing for joy. The birds are being fed. The lilies of the valley are being clothed in glory. All that's happening outside, and we're locked up inside. Biology and meteorology and astronomy tell us some things about creation. But sunrises and sunsets, thunderstorms, starlit skies, crashing waves, purple mountains, right? Those things reveal other things about God. Engage in the creation with the question, what does the artwork reveal about the artist? Right? Any artist pours themselves into the art that they're, they're doing. That they're, there's, there's a part of them that gets put into that, and you, and you can know the heart of the. You don't meet the artist. You, you don't know the, the, the art is not the artist. And sometimes we, we confuse that with creation, but it is the gift of the artist to us. Engage in creation, get outside, look around you, breathe the air, go down to the beach. Some of you Californians haven't been there in, I don't know, probably 10 years. <laughs> there are people who would love to be 15 minutes from the beach. Come on, people, let's go. Let's get outside. Feel the sand between your toes. I know it's going to get in your car on the way back. It'll remind you that you were there. Engage creation. What does it tell us? What does it communicate about the creator? Engage. The second thing then is thank the creator. 
Paul writes this passage in Romans chapter 1. It says, since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made. So actually the people are without excuse. If you look around, you can see the stuff that God has made, and it's clear that somebody did something here, right? The the laws of, of science tell us, physics, that things don't go from disorder to order, things go from order to disorder, unless something acts upon them. And then he's, so you can look around, you can see God's handiwork and the things that he made, but then he goes on to say, but although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God, nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. This descent into darkness began when people stopped worshiping the Creator and started worshiping created things and stopped giving thanks to the Creator. So reverse the order, right? If if we lost track when we stopped worshiping the Creator, and giving thanks, we descended into darkness. Let's rise up out of darkness by turning again and giving thanks to the Creator and glorifying God. Because it reminds us that He is Almighty and that He is Father. Engage. God's creation. Give thanks to the creator. The third thing is to pray our Father. To pray our Father. You can use Jesus' prayer in the Lord's Prayer, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day, God, you're sustaining our daily bread. Forgive us our debts, Heavenly Fathers. We forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. God, your creator, you are our provider. Father, you are our sustainer. You are our redeemer. Pray as Jesus taught us to pray, Father. I heard a story this week about um, a guy who was, uh, he was on a flight, and it was a pretty seasoned um, pretty seasoned traveler, uh, and um, he's on a flight, a long flight, and uh, as often happens when you fly, the captain came on um, the intercom and said, hey, you know, there's some turbulence coming up ahead, we're going to turn the, the seatbelt light on, and that's not an unusual thing, and so everybody goes back to their seats, and the flight attendants continue oftentimes after you're in their seats, they can still move about the cabin. But then the, cabin, the, the captain came back on and next level instructed the flight attendants to take their seats, discontinue service, right? Then you know that this is probably going to be a pretty bumpy ride, even like the seasoned people are being told to, to go to their seats. And as they continued on the flight, um, it was even beyond what the seasoned traveler was accustomed to. And the people all around him were looking pretty nervous as the plane was being tossed um, to and fro amidst the turbulence and, and there was lightning flashing out, out the windows and, and people were getting pretty unsettled. And, and while this is all going on, he notices that a few rows ahead, there's this, there's this little girl. And she's occasionally like moving around in her seat. Her legs are tucked under, up underneath her, then she moves them out, but she's reading a book and she seems unfazed by everything that's going on around them. Everybody else is like freaking out and this little girl is like just living her life in her little world. And they made it despite some of their fears. They got to the airport. They're um, getting off the plane and the little girl stayed in, in her seat. Um, she, was, she was traveling alone. Um, I've neglected to tell you that part of the story. Um, and, and he couldn't help himself as, as he's exiting the plane. He just, he's, said, well, I'm, I just, 
I, you were so calm during the flight. He says, you, you have so much composure. She says, the little girl said, I wasn't worried at all. My daddy's flying the plane. My daddy's flying the plane. Our father in heaven, almighty, if he's flying the plane, people, we're going to get there. Simple words. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. Lord, thank you that you are flying the plane. Because there's been a lot of turbulence all around us and within us. Thank you that because you are Father Almighty, that you can, that you're able to, and that you desire to, to bring us to the end of our story and into your glory. Thank you that we are people of hope through a relationship with you. And I pray that, as I said at the beginning, as people of hope, people who believe in a future that's different than the one that we're living in right now, that we would be people who act, believing in a better world, believing in a future glory, and acting for the good of the world that we live in, and bringing goodness and life and love to others. I pray in Jesus' name.